Let's pray now. Father, thank you for your merciful and gracious words that you give to us. Lord, these are words from your throne, from your heart to us. We're so ever thankful that you give them. And Lord, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so, Lord, even though we may perceive that certain things are important for a physical body, Lord, there's nothing more important than to get into your word today and satisfy our soul, satisfy our spirit, Lord. And so we ask you to bless us, Lord, with your presence, through your word, your spirit, your spirit making it real to us, lifting up Jesus, making him real to us in our lives. Please, Lord, help us to submit to you. And when we leave, Lord, this place, we will be doers of your word as well. And so, Lord, we ask you to help us to be hearers now and to be doers later. And so we pray that you would bless our study. In Jesus' holy name, amen. First Kings 17, First Kings 17. Uh, when was the last time we read about Elijah here? I can't remember, but if someone remembers, that'd be great. Uh, when was the last time you read about Elijah? Anybody? If you remember? Six months ago? Recently? Okay, recently. Frank, what about you? Yesterday, well, we're in good company. All right. First Kings 17, First Kings 17, only the first six verses. We'll tackle the next one, the, 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 the verses after that, next time we get together for our prophecy update. But we're trying to stagger them so we can still get to the Psalms, but get to important passages, which I believe has something to do with um, the prophets. Elijah in the last days, we did Joseph in the last days, we did Paul in the last days. I think Elijah is a perfect man. Uh, to show us what it'd be like, what it's going to be like in the last days. I think we did a study like five years ago. It's called Elijah, uh, the man of God for the last days or something like that. It's up there somewhere, somewhere in the, in the internet world. Uh, but it was a study from James. We took what James says about Elijah and applies it to the New Testament Christian. So don't think that Elijah is just some Old Testament prophet has nothing to do with us today. James says he does. James takes that story from Elijah and puts it right into our lap for our New Testament understanding. So let's read first six verses. Now, Elijah the Tishbite, who was from the settlers of Gilead, he's a Gileadite, he said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. The word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Kareth, which is beyond the Jordan or east of the Jordan. And it shall be that you will drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. And so he went and lived by the brook of Kareth, which is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he would drink from the brook. Now, we're told that his prophecy was going to take three and a half years. Three and a half years, there'll be no rain nor dew for three and a half years. As soon as you hear the three and a half years, think great tribulation, think the book of Revelation, meaning the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. We're not going to touch on that tonight, but just to prepare the table, this is something to do with end times. Even though it is an Old Testament idea, it is an end times fulfillment that is going to be playing out here through Elijah. So here's the Tishbite. He's from the Gileadites. If you know the story of the tribes, tribe of Gilead, or from the, the aspect of Gilead, from the land of Gilead, <clears throat> it was actually one of the tribes uh, occupied that area. Uh, he was a northerner. He was a northerner. He was, uh, he was not from Judea. He was from the northern part of Israel. And he sent to the kingdom of Israel. And Ahab is the king. As soon as you hear Ahab, you think of another person. And you think of his wife, Jezebel, right? And Elijah is God's man for the hour. Now think of this. It's probably one of the worst times in Israel's history. Idolatry, immorality, violence. Uh, people gone away from the word of God. They're committing uh, fornication and all kinds of just desperate sin. They have stopped worshiping in Jerusalem because that's where the temple was. The northern kingdom had split already. And therefore, you had a wicked, terrible leader 
married to somebody worse, which was Jezebel. She was not a Jew. She was not from Israel. She was from Sidon. She was a Sidonian. And she was the daughter of the priest of the Sidonians. So not just an average uh, Jane. She was actually the daughter of a pagan uh, pagan priests who worship Baal, who worship Baal and Ashtoreth and all the Canaanite deities. And we're told here, we're not going to go too long on this. We're told here that he comes and before he leaves to what the Lord called him to do, he has a word for Ahab. What is the word for Ahab? His word is no rain, nor dew for these years, except by my word. As soon as he says that he takes off. God tells him to go, and he takes off, and we follow the map here. We'll use this little map, because next week, or next time, people usually get me on next week, but it's next time, um, we're going to be reading about where he goes to, not just in Israel, he's in Israel now, he's at the edge of Israel, but he goes outside of Israel. He goes to Sidon. He goes to Zarephath, Zarephath, not in the land, outside the land. So you got some problems right away. Why would God tell somebody to go further away from Jerusalem and even further away outside of Israel to a pagan land, to a foreign land, to a land full of idolatry like uh, Sidon was? That's where uh, Jezebel came from. That's where the priests were. And that's where she was from. And that's where all the idolatry and immorality came into Israel, came from there. And God sends them right into the... I guess the the belly of the beast, you could say, into the heart of the matter, into the root of the problem, and he goes to a difficult place. So God tells them to go. It was not Elijah's idea, but God is going to take care of them. God is going to take care of them. So think of the prophet this way. It wasn't easy for him. You know, we think of just, he just went. Like, okay, he just went. But think about what he must have thought. Where am I going? Oh, to the desert. You're going to... Beyond the Jordan, east of the Jordan, would have been this place right here, the Brook of Kareth. And uh, it's a desert land, by the way, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, is where John the Baptist was um, also headed uh, after he was called by the Lord to preach in the wilderness. And he's, he's there, he's warning Israel. He warned Israel, and they did not repent. They did not repent. So the nation was not repenting. Ahab was in charge. And Jezebel was in charge of the spiritual condition of Israel. Not a good time. But God tells him one final warning and head out. He does, and he goes to the desert, away from all that he knows, away from all that he was used to, away from everything he was dealing with. And next time, he'll be going to the unclean land, to Sidon, to the people of the Gentile people. And he needed to understand how to minister to people in difficult places, isn't it? We all like to go to the nice places to minister to, but sometimes God will send us to the most difficult places and to the most difficult people, to the most difficult people to deal with. And those are the ones that don't know God, have replaced the knowledge of God with idols. And so God provides for Elijah. Now it says here in verse 3 that he goes to the brook of Kareth, to the east of the Jordan. That's God's word. Turn eastward and hide. Hide yourself. Get away from it all. Now, if you know the story, um, there's a lot of things I assume you know. So hopefully you do know it, because otherwise it takes too long. There were other prophets. There were other prophets in Israel. But most of them, remember what happened to them? Most of them had been killed already. Most of them had been killed already. Not all of them. Not all of them. There were still a few. Now, Elijah did not know who they were. He might have known them later, but he did not know who they were. He did not know who they were because they were also hidden. Remember, Obadiah hid them 50 to a cave, and he put them away from Jezebel, and he was a good guy. He was actually uh, following the Lord. He was obeying the Lord. He feared the Lord. But Elijah didn't know who they were. Actually, Elijah says later, I'm the only one left. He had it almost right. He was one of the few left, but there's still 7,000. This is 7,000 right here. This is still 7,000. We may not know all the 7,000s. We might not be in contact with all the 7,000, but we, don't know, we know a few. We know a few 7,000 faithful. In fact, we were praying with some of them earlier today, right? We were praying with a few, with the faithful ones. And that's what Elijah felt. Now he's got to hide. 
and he's got to hide, and he goes where God tells him to go. He tells him to go to remove his place uh, from, from basically everything that he knew to a place that he wasn't really accustomed to and to be completely dependent on God. And God takes him out of the midst of it and puts him in the desert, pretty much in the desert area. That's where it was. And God was going to do something to Israel. What was God going to do to Israel, to the nation? To, was that? He's going to judge it. He is going to judge Israel. What's the means of judgment? What well, says in verse 2? No rain, right? Drought. As I, in fact, it says, as for the Lord God of Israel is before whom I stand, no rain nor dew except by my word. Later on, we'll see how he prays and God blesses it again and gives it rain. But terrible economic conditions, awful economic conditions. Right? Remember, there was an agricultural economy. If you have no rain, you have no grain. And if you have no grain, you can't sell it, you can't have food, you can't have means of economic exchange. You have a very difficult situation. And those were the people that, those were the people of Israel, the children of Israel were facing a very difficult time. But how was God going to take care of Elijah? No doubt it was problematic for everybody, but he tells them to do something. Go and I will show you where to go. I will hide you and... Uh, don't worry about the food, because <laughs> I'm sure Elijah said, well, what am I going to eat in the desert? I mean, if God just tells you to get going and go somewhere, first thing you got to think, well, how am I going to take care of myself? How am I going to take care of my the family? How am I going to take care of all these things? Don't worry about that. Just trust me, because you'll have something even better. What was the one thing he needed more than anything else? In fact, it's, you have to, I don't want to say you have to read between the sentence here, but it's, it's part of the conversation that Elijah has with the Lord. What does Elijah need from God more than anything? More than anything. Beyond that. He's going to give him water. But it's something that, it, beyond that, his word. His word, right? His word. He's going to tell him, go, I'm going to tell you where to go. Go, I'm going to tell you what to do. And later on, he tells him, get out of here and go to Zarephath. It was always God's direction that needed to happen for Elijah to survive, not just with the food and the water. He was going to provide that. He needed to provide direction for Elijah. And that's what happened. No matter what we do, no matter what we say, no matter what we have or don't have, the one thing we cannot lose is God's word. Amen. No matter the income or lack of income, no matter, uh, no matter what happens in our lives, whether we have a lot or we have a little, we need God's word. And Israel was going to lose God's word. Israel was going to lose God's word. First, economic judgment, no rain, no grain, no money. Secondly, he was going to lose God's word. How did Israel lose God's word? Yeah, where did Elijah go? He went, out, he went to the edge of the nation. He was the only one speaking. Only one speaking out. The other ones were hiding. Now Elijah hides. Most likely, by most commentators, you could say that for a period of about six months to a year, it's where the prophets had been speaking to Ahab. Some were killed, some were hidden. He's the last one. One final word, no rain until my word comes, says the Lord. Through my word, says uh, um, Elijah. And then he goes. It's the last word that Israel's going to have for some time. Economic judgment, no word. That's the most difficult one, isn't it? Because now without the word of God, they can't repent. Now without the word of God, their inability, they have an inability to repent. They, they don't know what the truth is. They have Ahab. They have religious institutions. They still have Samaria. And they still have the golden calves. They still have a religious service. You know that, right? They still had religion. They still, it wasn't like they were atheists all of a sudden. They still had religion. They still went to churches. They still went to listen to the false prophets. They still went to listen to the false teachers. But the true word of God was somewhere else. Now, that is very dangerous, isn't it? Yes. Well, you can actually think you go to a church, you go to a service, you go to yes. the prophets of Baal church, whatever, you know, and you go and you sit and you think it's the word of God. You think it's the word of God. But, you know, it's like, hey, has anyone seen Elijah in a while? I don't know, man. He's gone. Oh, well, we just keep going to our service. We just keep going to our motion. Oh, there's Jezebel again, and there's Ahab again. 
But without the word of God to clarify what was happening, people were just going through their daily lives. Hey, hasn't rained in about a couple of weeks. Hasn't rained in a month. It's going to rain. It's not going to rain for a while and people are going to start to notice, but they won't be able to know what to do until Elijah shows up again. But it's going to take a little bit of time. And let's continue. He's sent to the edge of the land. This is the east of the Jordan. It's very clear. Twice it says where he goes. Kareth, east of the Jordan, beyond the Jordan, no temple, no supplies, a difficult place, no doubt, a difficult life. How did God provide for him? Well, unusual. <laughs> Anybody reading for the, with a Jewish mind would think of, what in the world is happening? These are not good things. Ravens. Ravens. If you read the law, the Levitical law, they are not a good thing. Right? They are not a good thing. In fact, for the most part, I hear some birds. For the most part, right, birds, in the scripture, traditionally and metaphorically are not a good thing, unless specifically it's told that they actually do some good. Like Jesus talked about the sparrow. That's a good thing. But Jesus also said the birds of the air come and they take away the seed. Now, when Jesus interpreted that parable, he said that was Satan, right? In the book of Revelation, we have all kinds of unclean birds and all kinds of unclean things in Babylon. And he said these are products of demons. Birds in, in biblical imagery, concept, metaphors, has something to do with demonic powers. Remember the birds that came and they attacked Abraham? Remember the birds that came, and, and Jeremiah is there, and he says, hey, leave it to the birds, because there's going to be a great judgment. In fact, the book of Revelation follows up on that, because eventually the judgment is going to come, and the birds are going to come and feast on the carcasses, right? It's going to be a future judgment that's going to come, not only to Babylon, to the whole world. There's going to be given over to the powers of Satan. It's going to be a judgment, a complete judgment. But in this case, God says, I am going to provide for you, and you're cut off from the land, but I'm going to give you the unclean birds. Now, if God says, oh, come say, if God sends them to feed Elijah, but they're in, 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 in the Vedical laws is bad, how can, we, how can we marry them together and say, this is a good thing? Because what Jesus told, God calls you, he calls me to his kingdom. Okay, so if God uses something and he wants to use it to be something for good, then it's clean. Then it's good. Okay. How do we marry this together? Because automatically it was like, whoa, this is not a good thing, right? Well, God is going to use something that he's used before. He's used unusual means to provide for his people. And here's one of them. Now, they did it by the morning. It says he provided bread and meat in the evening. Where does a bird get bread? That's what I thought, right? Uh, and he does it twice. <laughs> Somewhere, right? Yeah. So the bird has to get it from somewhere where God provided because they're not usual bakers, right? They're not the bakers. They're not the usual type to make the bread. And they bring meat, something that Elijah could eat. They usually feed on carcasses and things like that. So somehow God has instructed these ravens to provide for Elijah something that is good. And so this would have been unheard of for any Jew to, to use it. So Elijah gets that. But it's not the first time, right? It's going to be another time. In a barren wilderness, later on in the chapter, we're told that he goes to another place. He goes to uh, Zarephath, Sidon. And then how, God, how does God provide for them, for Elijah, in that place? Does anybody remember that story? He goes to see a, a widow with a son, right? And instead of bread and meat, he gets oil and grain, oil and flour, Right? And uh, by the way, she would have been wearing black because she was a widow. In Middle East culture, would have probably wore black for the rest of your life, signifying that you're a widow unless she remarried. Uh, so she was probably a widow, uh, still a widow, and wearing black. So things that are dark, seemingly, ravens and a lady, a widow wearing black, uh, are the one thing or the things that God is going to use to provide for Elijah. And so pay attention real, uh, just as you read it how God is going to provide to Elijah in a very unusual way, difficult circumstances. It is by no means a vacation spot. If you ever go to the east, even today, it's wilderness, jackals, and all kinds of wild animals are still there. And yet he is taken care of by, the by God in the fact that it's a fulfillment of what Jesus said, or Jesus did say that, but in Deuteronomy chapter 8, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The most important thing Elijah had in that brook, what's the word? It was God telling him, hey, do this. Hey, stay here. Hey, wait here until I tell you. And he had to be faithful in all of this, right? And everything else could be broken. Everything else could be barren in your life. Everything else could be barren in my life. But if you still hear from God, you are better off than 99.9% of the world. That is absolutely true. You could be by yourself. And he was. It's the hardest thing to be by yourself. Barren, difficult, not so bad. (laughs) But away from family, away from all that you knew, away from even the places that you used to visit. And now you're in a situation that the Lord is calling you to do. And so, but the most important thing, Elijah never lost And he can rely on God's word. He can rely on what God was telling him, right? People can be unfaithful. People that you relied on before. People that have served with you before. People that you counted on before. Can all of a sudden leave. Can all of a sudden go. And uh, you can rely on your, you know, income. You can rely on your home. You can rely on your house. You can rely on your career. What if that's taken away? Because it can and we live in a, in a time right now, we'll get into our study in a minute, in our updates in a minute, where things are evaporating left and right. Another company yes. filed for bankruptcy today. Which one was it? I can't remember. GNC, thank you. Oh, you're, come up here, Frank. <laughs> GNC, GNC, again, among other ones, right? AT&T laid off a bunch of people. Uh, Cricket Wireless. What's that? What did GNC do? Bankruptcy. Oh, yeah. 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 So a lot of things can go right away. I mean, we're living in that kind of stage in life where, you know, because of the economic situation, things happen very, very quickly. But you can, if you count it on that and you rely on that and it's gone. But if you rely on God's word, if you rely on his teaching and what he wants us to do, you can always rely on him. Even though it may be gone, God can send ravens to you. God can still deal with you, and God can bring you to good things. Now, let's turn to the book of Genesis, because it's not the first time we hear about a raven being used. Genesis chapter 8, if you know the story, you know the account of Noah. Noah, Noah and the ark. There was water, and there was a raven. It was not just in Elijah's days, it was also in Genesis. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 7. Genesis chapter 8. I believe it's verse 7. Uh, let's do verse 6. At the end of the 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made, and he sent out a raven, and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, so she returned to him in the ark. For the water was on the surface of all the wa- uh, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put it out his hand and took her and brought her to, uh, the, uh, into the ark to himself. And he waited another seven days. And again he sent out the dove from the ark. And the dove came out toward him evening. And behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So no one knew that the water had abated from the earth. So a, a, a raven comes out, doesn't come back. <laughs> There's water. Then a dove. First time. Then a second time. Now, what does that mean? Anybody have any idea? Interesting. You're on the right track. What color is the the raven? Black. Black Black has to do with, obviously, it's at the beginning of something new, but God still had to deal with the darkness. God still had to deal with the sin. God still had to deal with things going on. But then he brings a dove. Right? And we're going to get to another passage where another dove is used with water. Right? Oh, yeah. That's, actually, it's in the same place where Elijah was. Anyway, um, then sends out the dove, comes back, sends out the dove again, comes back, olive leaf, right? And now you know the water had receded. There's something of Christ in this picture here. First, the black goes out, it's no use. Then God has to send the dove, fullness of the Spirit, right? Revealing Christ to us. First time, second time, then the water recedes, olive leaf, we have peace with God. That's what Genesis is trying to teach us, but obviously it's a true story. It's not just a teaching, it's a true story, but it's the raven, it's the birds, it's the water, and there's a man that is facing judgment, right? He just went through the judgment. Elijah was going through the judgment. What was the judgment? 
no rain on Israel. Water was no problem for Noah. There was plenty of rain, but it was still a judgment. There was still a judgment upon the whole world, and yet the raven is there, and God was still there. And of course, let's turn to John chapter 1. Let's turn to John chapter 1 because we're told of another story. This time, no raven. <laughs> Actually, there is a raven. There are ravens, I should say, but they come in an unusual form, not the way we think of. John chapter 1, and it's the story, of course, we know of John the baptizer. John the baptizer, right? And uh, we'll read it here. I'll just point it to you here. It's in the same location, in the same location. John chapter 1, verse 19. Now, this is a testimony of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Now, they went to John the Baptist. So it's found in the book of John, but the writer is the gospel writer. The gospel writer saying they went to see John. The Pharisees went to see John. Just want to be clear, because people get confused that they're talking about the same John. So John is writing, the apostle, about the baptizer. Verse 19, they went to see him, the Levites, the priests, and he confessed, and he did not deny, but confessed, I'm not the Messiah, and they ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? There's a story again, right? It's like a hyperlink. It's connected. And he said, I'm not. Are you the prophet? And he said, no. Now, what they were asking him, are you the one from Malachi chapter 4? Now, it will take me another hour if we go to Malachi 4, so I am going to resist temptation. Go read it on your own tonight. Malachi chapter 4. That's what they were asking. Are you the fulfillment of Malachi 4? Are you the Elijah, the forerunner who comes before the day of the Lord? Is God, is, is the Messiah going to come? Well, yeah, he's going to come, but it's not the day of the Lord. So there, there's some, well, he had, yeah, he's going to have the spirit of Elijah, but it, it was, Elijah was there in a sense, like John the Baptist, standing by some water. Let's keep going, because I don't want to get the cat out of the bag. Are you the prophet? Are you Malachi for fulfillment? Look what he says. He says, um, and he answered, no. And they said to him, who are you then? So that we may give you an answer. We give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he says, I am the voice crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah said. So he's saying it's not Malachi time yet. It's not Malachi 4 yet. Is Isaiah's time. What did Isaiah say in chapter 40? That there'll be a man who would come to make straight the way of the Lord. He will be in the wilderness to make straight the way of God. It's not Malachi 4 yet. That's still going to happen. It's Isaiah 40. John the baptizer is going to come, and he's going to make straight the way of the Lord. Now, we'll deal with Malachi for another time. But it says, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, why are you baptizing? There was water there. It was by the Jordan River, just beyond the Jordan. And if you're not the Messiah, no Elijah, nor the prophet. Now, they're asking him because they knew the story about Malachi. They knew the story about Elijah. They knew that Elijah would be by some water. And there he's John the Baptist. It would be logical to think that that was probably him. But it wasn't him. It was somebody who came in the power and spirit like Elijah in the same character. Now think of the, what Elijah was dealing with in 1 Kings 17. What was the condition of Israel? Judgment. Yeah, it was coming. In fact, it's not in this one, but it's, it's in another passage where John says, judgment is already coming. In fact, I know the Messiah is going to come and he's going to lay the axe at the root of the tree. The judgment is going to come, but he's coming. But there's something about the ravens. And let's continue. You're not the Christ. You're not the Elijah. You're not the prophet. From Deuteronomy 18. John answered and said, I baptize in water, but among you stands whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me. And the thong of those sandals I'm not worthy to untie. These things he said, uh, these things took place in Bethany, beyond the Jordan, similar word to what he said, beyond the Jordan, east of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. Well, there it is. 
The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after he comes a man who is higher ranked than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him. But so when, uh, but so that he might manifest, be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testifies saying, I have seen the spirit descending on him like a dove. Now you got to go back to Genesis again and reach back to that one. And then connects back to Elijah in 1 Kings 17. Water, dove, Genesis 8. Right? Elijah, raven, water, John the Baptist. And he said to me to baptize in water. I did not recognize him, sorry. Oh, no, I missed 32. Yeah, John testified saying, I have seen the spirit descending like a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him, and I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one whom, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. Verse 36, John looked at him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world. And he told his disciples, and they followed him right after that. So John sees Jesus, and he's the one with the Spirit, but he has to get baptized in the water. A time of judgment was upon Israel. They were under the Romans, and God was not very happy with them because they had all kinds of issues with uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the temple worship. There was a tremendous drought spiritual drought coming or was there for 400 years remember elijah leaves there's no prophet malachi ends and there's nothing for 400 years and then who shows up john the baptizer god began to speak again he's beginning to speak again a drought was beginning to be over just like elijah is going to say okay it's going to be over three and a half years he prays and then the cloud comes and it starts to rain god begins to bring down the rain again in the person of Jesus. There's water, there's the spirit. And then later on in about five chapters later, Jesus says, I'm the bread from heaven. So there was the bread again. There was the water again, just like Elijah's day. By the way, in second Kings, another guy shows up by the Jordan by, and does a miracle with water. And he's connected with Elijah. Anybody know who that guy is? Elisha, yeah, and uh, it's a fascinating story because there's a deeper ministry with Elisha, isn't there? There's a deeper, the things that Elijah did are repeated by Elisha, but in a greater capacity. Why? He had the double portion of the Spirit. God saw it fit that he would do greater things, right? Kind of an interesting thing because Jesus said he would tell us, he would send us out, and we would do Greater things than he did. Now, it doesn't mean we have more power than Jesus. And it says that we would be able to do more because his spirit will not be localized in a geographical location in a body. It would be upon all believers and all who believe will go out and do the work of the ministry. It would be the power of Jesus working through us. It would surely be do greater ministry, greater things. But that's a different story. That's a different time. A time of judgment was coming, but God sent Jesus to bring the ravens. Now, who are the ravens here? Because we didn't read about the ravens, did we, in John? The ravens are the Pharisees. Ah, interesting. Are the ravens the Pharisees? Who else came to John? Jesus. Who else came to John? Jesus. Prostitutes, tax collectors, and Roman soldiers came to hear John. And what did they do? They heard John and they received the word. They're the ravens. The ravens were still there, but not the birds. <laughs> why, why were they, uh, remember, they were the unclean ones. Who were considered unclean? Tax collectors, prostitutes, and Gentiles. Here were the ravens. So we got the whole picture now. The ravens are there. God will bring the raven. Now, he can make ravens into beautiful, into his children. <laughs> Anybody here an next raven <laughs> Not the football team, but, and, you know, <laughs> right? Ex-ravens. He can make ravens into his children. He can make us right. He can use us. And that's what God, is came, God, what Jesus came to do, turning from sin toward himself by the way of the Spirit. So Jesus came, and there's a turning of people to God. 
But there's also Ahab and Jezebel. Did those people ever repent? No. At the time of Jesus, was there a separation of people? Meaning some believed, some didn't? Yes. Some of them came, right? Did you read that? Pharisees, Levites. Um, he did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Terrible, huh? A Gentile consider a thief. Well, a Jew can be a thief as well as a Gentile. Yeah. They're just describing who they were. Tax collectors. Mm-hmm. Oh. Well, it's, it's describing unclean things. They could have been Jews, too. Could have been Jews, too. But the Romans set came. The Romans came. And those were considered the Gentiles. They were the unclean ones, right? Uh, so all of them came to hear John, and all of them came to get the bread of life, and all of them came to get the water of life, the one that comes, and only the one that Jesus comes, uh, only Jesus gives. The second half of the chapter, we'll do it next time, which is when he goes to Zarephath. And there's another whole story, because now God says, I'm going to dry up the brook. Oh, God, I love the brook. Lord, I love the ravens bringing me food. Don't get used to it. I am going to provide a whole new way. Anybody here uncomfortable when God changes things on you? Yeah. Has it ever happened to you? You get used to it. You go, oh, Lord, thank you for that paycheck. Thank you for that provision. Oh, you're so good, Lord. Okay, you learn. Good. You learn to trust me in those little things. I want you to trust me in bigger things. Give it all up. <laughs> give up the brook. Well, if you don't want to give it up, I'm going to dry it up. <sighs> okay. And no more ravens are going to come. Now you got to get out of your comfort zone. He was already out of his comfort zone, but he was on the edge. You see, he's on the edge. He was still in Israel, but he's just kind of on the edge, just right beyond the Jordan. Now he has to go completely out of the country. I'm not saying God's sending you to a mission field or anything like that, so please don't read into it. I'm saying he's sending you to an uncomfortable. It could be your next-door neighbor. You know, that's a foreign land sometimes for us, right? <laughs> it could be your neighbor, and it could be... A Gentile, in a sense of an unbeliever. How am I going to deal with that? How are you going to be able to minister to somebody like that? What if God uses them to minister to you and things that you need so that you can minister to him the bread of life and the water that he needs? It's a whole new challenge, isn't it? Because now it's a, he had to learn to wait on the Lord, to hear from his word, and to wait by the brook to now be sent to a different ministry, a different ministry, a deeper ministry, a deeper thing. These are things that God takes us from one place to another. And so Elijah has great hope for Israel, doesn't he? He wants Israel to repent. In fact, that was his prayer. And God's going to give him that opportunity to, to minister to a whole nation. In 1 Kings 18, when they, you know, he goes after the false prophets. Uh, but he first has to deal with this. First has to deal with himself by the brook, with the word, God's provision. Then you minister to others then another ministry comes later and so even though elijah was an amazing prophet the greatest of the prophet in the old testament he still has to learn from god he still has to depend on god he still has to wait on god isn't that kind of hard thing isn't it no matter how far we've been in ministry how god has used us in the past and even if we have some ministry that god has used tremendously we still need it we still need that ministry we still need that uh, the deepening of our faith and hearing from God and waiting on him and then doing things like, yeah, Zarephath, oh, no. my neighbor, my, 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 my family's house, <laughs> you know, I have to go minister there. Yep, sometimes it's going to be uncomfortable and difficulty, but at the end of the day, God will get the glory. And at the end of the day, God will see to minister to you and feed you and take care of you because that's what's happening here. This is end times ideas here. We're developing these end times ideas because this takes place at a time of great judgment, great economic uh, instability within Israel, great idolatry, great immorality, great false teachers and false spirituality rising up. And it seems like Elijah at least thought he was the only one left. He wasn't, but you feel like it sometimes. And I'm sure you've probably wondered through this life and through this uh, uh, and, and as you walk with the Lord and wonder like, Lord, is anybody else? Is there any more helpers around? Now, Jesus did say, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more laborers into the field. Absolutely. We ought to pray for that. Elijah didn't know who they were, but God has them. 
and somebody might be praying for you, somebody might be praying for us, that we may get to know them, and we pray for that as well. 